the high representative who chaired the meeting will present you with the yes. outcome of the meeting and the main element discussed, after which we will take mm -hmm. a few questions uh, via uh, the system set up by the Council. Thank you very much. High representative, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Today we had uh, the second video conference with the European Union Defence Ministers in just six weeks. The newly appointed Chief Executive of the European Defence Agency, Mr. Sedevi, was with us for the first time. Our discussion focused today on the security and defence implication of the coronavirus pandemic. Over the past month, we have seen that armed forces have been playing a crucial role in addressing the pandemic by supporting civilian actors and providing cross-border support among member states. There are many examples of that. The task force that we established within the EU military staff after our last meeting on 6 April has been working closely with member states to gather examples and best practices and ensure exchange of information and lessons learned from each other. As we face a global crisis, cooperation with partners is essential. And this is why I have invited uh, two of our closest security and defence partners to take part of our discussion today. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg and United Nations Under Secretary General for Peace Operations Jean-Pierre Lacroix that provided us with a very useful update on ongoing work in their organizations and the way we can increase our cooperation. It's clear that this crisis will have far-reaching implications for our societies, for our economies, but also for our security and defense policy. Together with member states, we have started to identify and discuss concrete lessons and strategies, implications of the pandemic, paving the way for the future of our security and defense policy. And there was a broad consensus that we should act along several axes. First, to reinforce the modalities for the use of military assets to support civilian authorities in response to the pandemic. The armed forces in different areas of expertise, security, medical, and logistic, have provided and continue to provide a vital help in the fight against the spread of the virus. This is why, for the first time since the Ebola crisis in 2014, the European Union Movement Planning Cell within the EU military staff has been activated. This will allow to request European Union member states military support to transport medical and humanitarian supplies at the request of the Emergency Rescue Coordination Center. It will also allow responding to requests for support from our partners, such as the United Nations. And there are several of these requests on the way. Second, we will continue to do our utmost to maintain our operational presence on the ground while the safety of our personnel deployed in our common security and defense policy missions and operations remains a priority, we need to ensure that the missions and operations continue to deliver on their task to the extent possible and explore ways to support our partners in tackling the pandemic. We and agreed the that the redeployment of personnel on the ground should take place in a coordinated manner as soon as conditions allows. Third, we need to strengthen our own preparedness and resilience for the future. To this end, we can, for instance, conduct exercises to strengthen our work on cyber security or countering hybrid threats and enhance our efforts to counter disinformation, including related to the coronavirus. Intentional and coordinated disinformation campaigns as we have seen, are real threats to European and global security. Fourth, the lessons learned from this crisis should be an additional driver for capability development and defense cooperation. There is a growing demand for military assistance in support of civilian response, 
in the context of the health crisis. Some ongoing PESCO projects can play a role here and we will explore new areas of, of cooperation inside this framework. And finally, as this crisis also hits our economy, we need to secure the necessary funding for security and defense, both in member states and at EU level. The pandemic will very likely deteriorate our security environment in the years to come. That's clear. The pandemic will be a new threat and will deteriorate our security environment. And uh, which, uh, this only will increase the need for a stronger European Union security and defence. The coronavirus will increase the need for a stronger European Union security and defence and for a stronger union in the world. We will continue working on all these important issues and we will revert to this during our next meeting in June. And after being explaining what was about on this Council, I am ready to take your questions now. Thank you very much. I will start with Robin. Uh, Robin Emmert. Thank you very much. Hi, Who Rep. Is it? Is uh, it? Ah. Reuters. Reuters. Robin Emmert, Reuters. Let me, let me see if it works. Please. So, hi, Rep. Next week, we expect the Commission to come forward with the proposals for a new EU budget. I wondered, is there a risk that the Euro Defence Fund and military mobility will not get the funding that they deserve because of the need for an economic recovery fund? Thank you. Well, first, I am not sure that uh, next week the Commission will have been ready to, f to present the result of the work we are doing on that uh, very complex and difficult issue. But for sure, the, you know, uh, suddenly a new uh, factor demanding resources has appeared. It was not in the agenda. We have to completely change our approach to the financial perspective because we have a new and completely different scenario. And uh, I hope that in this scenario, the resources allocated to the defense and security policy will not diminish because, I, as I said before, the, the coronavirus has brought a new threat and it requires a stronger defense and security policy, a stronger Europe in the world. And it depends also on the resources allocated to these policies. But I cannot give you any specific detail because the work is still not finished. Nureddin, then. Bonsoir, Nureddin. We can't hear you. Bonjour. Oui, bonjour. OK. Bonjour. Oui. Vous m'entendez maintenant On t'entend. Très bien. Oui. Euh, bonjour, monsieur le haut représentant. Euh, la situation dans les pays environnants de l'Europe, ça veut dire, je parle particulièrement du... Moyen-Orient et de l'Afrique du Nord, vous avez parlé de l'impact à l'échelle internationale globale de ce, cette crise. Dans ces pays proches de l'Europe, il y a la baisse des revenus du tourisme, il y a la baisse des revenus pétroliers, il y a l'impact de la crise euh, sanitaire, combien même limitée. Pouvez-vous dire un mot si vous êtes inquiet que cette crise, combinée aux baisses des ressources économiques, pourrait déstabiliser les pays de la région. Merci. Il n'y a pas seulement que cette région-là qui court le risque de déstabilisation politique. En général, tous les pays émergents et tous les pays en développement vont subir de plein fouet les conséquences économiques de la crise. Vous l'avez dit, et je le répète, j'incite même encore plus que vous, les remittances, les transferts des immigrants vont diminuer parce que l'activité économique dans les pays d'accueil va diminuer. Euh, 
la rente pétrolière pour les pays qui sont fortement producteurs de pétrole va produire une, une difficile situation dans, dans son budget. Mais il n'y a pas que le pétrole, il y a les matières premières en général. Le tourisme, vous l'avez dit, bien sûr. Donc euh, nous avons des, des sources de, de financement qui vont se tarir. Et tout ça, ça va sans doute produire des de problèmes économiques d'abord, peut-être politiques après. Mais ça, ce n'est pas seulement dans le pays de notre environnement prochain. En général, dans toute l'Afrique et l'Amérique latine, ça va être un problème. Et évidemment, je suis très, très préoccupé pour les événements qui peuvent se produire comme conséquence de la crise économique qui a suivi à la crise, à la crise sanitaire et à la crise politique qui peut devenir. Merci. Euh, et maintenant, euh, Jacopo Politico. Politico. Hi, uh, good morning. Good afternoon. You can hear me? I have uh, a question on Iwini because, uh, as far as I can understand, the Monta is blocking the appointment of the new commander, and also there was also, was also blocking the budget for the commission. The what? The so, follow was ordering Malta. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, can you hear me? To you. I'm listening to you, but uh, I'm uh, very badly. Repeat. Very badly. Sorry, I tried to speak up and see whether you can hear me better. Okay. My question is on Operation Irini, hmm? Operation Irini, whether you think that with Malta uh, uh, blocking the budget and uh, the, op the appointment of the new commander, uh, the operation uh, is at risk, or whether any kind of deal has been uh, reached or is in the making with Malta to, uh, uh, to unblock this issue? And uh, what's your answer to Serraj's interview saying that uh, the operation is at risk of helping Haftar? Thanks. Well, there is, this is not a deal to be done with Malta. Uh, I've been talking several times, the last one this uh, afternoon with my colleague, the Foreign Affairs Minister of Malta, and this issue has been raised on the Foreign Affairs uh, Defense Council that we have just finished. I understand the concerns of Malta because they are facing a strong push on the wave of migrants coming from Libya. I understand perfectly, and I am trying to mobilize all our capacities from the Home Commissioner here in the Commission and with the member states that can be involved in order to try to, to, to help Malta to face the situation. But at the same time, I don't think that the solution is too, too difficult, the Irini operation, because the Irini operation is being conceived to help uh, to stop the fighting in Malta, to stop the fighting in Malta is a way of stabilizing politically, um, sorry, Malta in Libya. And the political stabilization in Libya is a conditioning for uh, the controlling the migrants' wave in the mid central Mediterranean. So in the medium term, the best way of uh, facing the, this, this challenge for Malta is the stabilization of, of Libya, and it depends on Irini, among many other things, but among many other things, but also it depends on the well working of uh, this mission, among others. Uh, the Foreign Affairs Minister of Malta understood perfectly what I was talking with him, and I hope that these obstacles will be, will be under control on the next days, and the Irini operation can start operating fully. And about the uh, Sarraj uh, declarations, I, I am not aware of this declaration. I've been in closed doors working on the Foreign Af uh, Defense Council the whole afternoon. But I've been having the possibility of talking with the Libyan authorities on the previous days. And uh, I think that I have to explain that uh, this operation is a way of controlling by sea and by air the arms traffic to control the arms embargo is not addressed against anyone, is trying to help the United Nations on making effective the arms embargo. But it's not addressed against any anyone. It's a 
trying to control by air and by sea. That's uh, the thing that the European Union can do. The, the route of the arms that goes to Libya. So it, it's not a threat against anyone, specifically. Patricia, from ANSA, please. Um. Uh, Patricia? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Uh, good evening. Hi, Representative. Uh, hi, Virginie. Um, I, would, uh, I saw your declaration, Hi, Rep, uh, on, on Libya. And I was wondering if you have something more specific on the, on the attitude that Turkey is taking in, in, in Libya, targeting Haftar, um, I, are you worried this will uh, escalate more, the situation? And also on Irini, I haven't well understood. Is the operation right now uh, opera fully operational or is because of Malta it has been stopped and it's not operating? Could you <laughs> clarify? Thank you. It was almost operating. Uh, some hours ago, I would say it's already operating. It's already operating. The, the first naval asset, the na Navy capacity, that uh, thanks to France, it's already on the, in the area. And the plane capacity provided by Luxembourg is also operational. So they are operating. The problem is that funding. And well, by the time being, we have already funding. But uh, I hope that the Malta objection will be will be cancelled in the following days. But the, 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 from yesterday, the mission is operating. Thank you. Um, I will... I'm sorry, on Turkey and on Turkey. Yes, you ask me if I am concerned. Well, to be concerned is my natural natural state. I am concerned the whole day for many different reasons, and. Yes, I am concerned by the situation in Libya, and it's not a secret, and there is nothing new that uh, the Turkey, together with other foreign powers, are intervening on in the, in the fight in Libya. In spite of the Berlin process, uh, the ceasefire has not been implemented, and by the contrary, the fight on the last weeks has been increasing quite a lot, and for sure I am concerned, but not more from Turkey than that from the other foreign powers that are intervening in Libya war. Thank you. I will now move on to Naomi. Hello, thank you for taking my question. Naomi O'Leary here of the Irish Times. Um, hi, Representative. I wonder if I could ask you, um, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has said that on the government's agenda should be discussions of possible annexation of parts of the West Bank. Um, France thinks that the EU should respond with something strong and concrete. What do you think? This is um, the most important item in the agenda of the next Foreign Affairs Council, who will take place next Friday afternoon. And I hope that the European Union will we present their position about uh, a possible annexation. We already did at the beginning when um, the Americans presented their peace plan, the so-called peace plan. We already did it. We will do it. In the meantime, we are waiting for the new Israeli government to be in office, and we will congratulate them. We will have a phone call, I hope. With the, foreign affairs, with the new Foreign Affairs Minister, and with the information I can have from this uh, contract, I will go to the Foreign Affairs Council and we will discuss which is going to be the position of the European Union. Thank you. Moving on to Stuart. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, hi, Representative. I want to follow up on an interview you did about a week ago in which you mentioned the EU had been a little naive about China. Then a few days later, the EU's ambassador to China published an op-ed striking a very different tone and agreeing to China's request for self-censorship. My question is, as head of the EAS, what would you do when an ambassador's attitudes do not seem to be 
in close compliance with your policy agenda. Thank you. Well, I, I don't think we have to... I don't think we have to to exaggerate the importance of these events. That China has a state-controlled media and there is censorship, it's nothing new, huh? Are you discovering it now? In its contest with Chinese media, the European Union delegation, as also other countries' embassies, operate in this environment and does everything they can to pass European Union messages to the Chinese public, in spite of these obvious challenges that uh, there is nothing new, and we knew perfectly in which environment we work. So the ambassador had to take a decision to pass the 99% of the European Union message, and which at the end was not even possible because the Chinese version of the, of the op-ed was not published. And the decision taken on the great time pressure, we, one can consider, and I am considering, that was not the right one to take. But uh, the administrative hierarchy of the external action service has discussed the matter with him to ensure that something like this will not happen again. And it was not the right decision to take, and in, on these occasions it would be better to go into consultation with the headquarters. But that being said, the ambassador continues to have my confidence. Thank you. I will move on to Anna. Anna from Euronews. Anna, are you? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, we can even see you. Hello, thank you. So, um, following this uh, pandemic, I would like to understand um, how vulnerable or how prepared is the queue to stop a hypothetical virological attack? I would like to understand if you have discussed about that and what could be done. Well, to tell the truth, we haven't gone deeper on this subject, which is our preparedness and capacity to participate in a biological war. By the time being, it's not in the, it's not in the agenda. We are dealing with a, a natural phenomenon, something that doesn't make part of a biological war. We haven't gone deeply on the subject of how could we face a biological war because it's, it's not in the agenda. Thanks, God. And I will now take Tommaso, which in, on my screen is, appears to be the last question. Tommaso? Tommaso, we cannot hear you. Still not. What's happening? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, Harep, uh, thank you for this press conference. Just, uh, uh, just two questions, if I may. The first one is on uh, China. If uh, uh, I wonder if you are planning uh, to raise with the Chinese authorities uh, also in, uh, I mean, uh, with uh, some discretion, the, the issue of the wet markets, which are very likely to be the origin of the pandemic currently ongoing. And uh, there was another question, but uh, I can't remember it uh, right now. Just this one. Thank you. <laughs> the question is, uh, where the wind mark is the origin of the pandemia? This was the question. are going to raise the, the issue of wet markets with Chinese authorities because the, the wet markets are very likely to be the, the origin of the pandemic. You know more Have than I. I. You know more than I. I don't know which is the sources of scientific authority you are using to say that the wet markets are likely to be the origin of the pandemic. We are supporting and we will support on the, on the Conference of the World Health Organization next 18th of May, a proposal for an inquiry, a scientific and independent inquiry to know better, 
to know more about which are the origins of the pandemics. I certainly I wouldn't dare visit the wet markets or not, because I am not, uh, <laughs> I don't have the scientific knowledge about it. And that's why we need uh, scientific research and scientific inquiry, a neutral, objective, based on scientific grounds, in order to know more what is happening and, and in order to prevent that this can happen again. Maybe the wet markets are part of the problem. But uh, frankly speaking, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to, to confirm your assumption. Follow up. Yes. Uh, the second question ah, you, is you, on. You remember also, the second question? Yeah, uh, I apologize for that. No. But, uh, just, just one question. If you have guidelines on the payment of a ransom for an hostage or not, as a, as a European Union, because uh, in Italy there are uh, quite um, some problem because there's a spokesperson of, of Al Shabab uh, who said on the record that the the, pay, the sum which was paid uh, to free up uh, Silvio Romano was actually used by Al Shabab will be used by Al Shabab to buy weapons. I wonder if it's a problem for you or not. Thank you. Yes, it's uh, it must be a problem for sure, but. Uh... Frankly speaking, I, I don't have more information to give to you, no? Sorry. Thank you. Um, I see that Patricia and Naomi have still their hand raised. Um, Patricia, do you have a follow-up or is it just a mistake? Yeah. Um. Patricia, we cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, can you we hear can. me now? Yes. Oh, thank you. Yeah, my, my okay. question is a follow up on Naomi's uh, question. I would like to, to understand whether, um, after this contact, uh, her representative will have with the uh, Israeli foreign minister, there is also an option to, to, to have sanctions on the table. Well, look, um, in the contest with the Foreign Affairs Minister of the new recently formed uh, Israeli government is just a normal context to congratulate him and to offer cooperation from the side of the European Union. I don't think we are going to go in, in deeply discussing about which are their plans and which will be our answer. This is not going to be the right moment. It's just a, a call to congratulate and to offer cooperation, and for sure maybe we will go in some specific uh, issues, but I don't expect to be engaged in a deeply discussion about uh, this very specific issue. No? So the important thing is to go to the Council and the Member States to present their point of views. You know that uh, everything in foreign policy requires unanimity, especially sanctions. So. Uh, we are, by the time being, far away of discussing about uh, sanctioning, but uh, it's important for, for me and for the European Union for the policy to know which is the position of the member states with respect to the with respect to the respect of international law, and how can we judge this uh, announced action? Hmm? in order to, to clarify the position of the European Union. But I cannot advance the result because I know that this is a very divisive issue inside the, the, the Council and different member states have different uh, positions. We, we noticed it when we discussed, discussed it about uh, a couple of months ago and I suppose that this divide is still uh, is there. So it will be a, a very interesting for a first council, maybe next Friday at the press conference, I will be able to give you more details about it. Naomi, you still have your hand raised. If it's on the same subject, okay. I suppose this was covered by this last answer. So with that, I would like to thank you all for your attendance. Thanks the High Representative uh, for his time, and I wish you a very nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.